now we're going to get into the crux of the funds and subsequently our speakers today. So Premium China Fund, the one that all of you know about, heard about, this is what our company was formed on, is our flagship fund sitting at about 300 million Australian dollars today. It is the still the largest China fund available in the country and it's on every single platform available uh, as well except for ING uh, as well as Colonial First Choice. Um, all the recommendations are there. The ratings have held strong all throughout the seven year period. But what's most important is performance. No matter how you want to slice, dice it, yes, last year the China fund went down over 20%. But the fact of the matter is, is that when you take a more long term view, and Simon talked about this, you know, f just, just take away the volatility for a second. Stop trading into China funds and Asian funds because it's a long term story. We have an annualized return in the last five years of about five and a half to six percent. Since inception, we are still delivering 11.1% net net declines. We are the best performing Asian fund in the country. Premium Asia Fund is the fund that we launched in uh, late 2009. So this is the broad Asia fund. So if you want to think about China fund and Asia fund, the China fund is 85% invested in China, Taiwan, Hong Kong. The Asia fund, on the other hand, is 65% invested in China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, with the rest spread across the rest of Asia. This fund is recommended by Zenith and Longsec with a Van Eyck B. And for those of you that follow S&P, it was also four stars. This fund's on, le on a less number of platforms, but if you want to help me build a business case for our Asia fund, uh, by all means, please contact me. My contact card, as well as my state manager, Derek Paz, uh, is also in the packs. This fund sits at $35 million as at today, and total performance since inception is 7.4%. We did very well because the fund's unhedged in 10, not so good in 11, and in 2012, we are significantly recovered along with the rest of the market. But it hasn't increased as much because it's unhedged. Now moving on to our next speaker is Alan Wang. Alan is the senior fund manager, or a senior fund manager, and head of research for China Equities. Now I've been told uh, on Monday already that never in the history of the 19 years uh, existence of value partners have they ever had two senior fund managers travel together because it's known as a security risk. Now Alan himself, so we're actually quite privileged, uh, Alan joined value partners in 2003 as an analyst and is now a senior fund manager. He's involved in leading various aspects of the company's investment process, including portfolio management, investment research, with a focus on mainland companies, including H, B, and A shares. Prior to joining Value Partners, he was a manager with Macquarie Bank in investment banking. And interestingly enough, Alan has spent 20 years of his life in Australia. So without further ado, I pass you on to Alan Wang. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's good to be here and back home in Sydney. Like Jonathan said, I lived in Australia for 19 years. I worked for Macquarie Bank for five years before moving to Hong Kong in 2003 to work as an analyst. Why did I do that? Because I believe the opportunities of the next one to two decades are truly in China and Asia. Now, the Chinese equity market, along with the rest of the world's financial market, particularly emerging market, has performed quite poorly last year. As you can see from this table, uh, the Hong Kong HSCI, uh, sorry, the Hong Kong HSI index, as well as HCI index, uh, has declined by about 20, 21 percent last year. Even the MSA China index has declined by roughly the same amount. But we do believe that you know the overall investment environment will get better this year, and let me tell you why. First of all, there are plenty of liquidity global-wise. Central banks around the world are essentially printing money. The United States has QE1 and QE2, and we do believe that there will be some form of quantitative easing if, if it's not QE3, that's, you know, they might call it something else. And uh, you know, this is a high probability of that happening. The Bank of Japan has instituted uh, quantitative easing as well. 
And of course, we all know that in Europe, they have the LTRO. Even in the People's Republic of China, they have, stood, they have started to cut bank reserve required ratios since the fourth quarter of last year. So the market will be flooded with money. The macro situation overseas aren't as bad as we think. At least things are stabilizing and easing off a little bit. In both the US and Europe, if you look at the P Purchase Managers Index, the PMI, which is the leading economic indicator, it's actually improving slightly. And more importantly, in the US, unemployment figures is coming down from the peak. Uh, the peak previously was 9.4%, now it's down to 8.5%, which is the latest number. Fund flow do play a very important part of capital market performance. You can see that um, in throughout last year, there has been net outflows of funds from Hong Kong China equity funds. In aggregate, the net outflow has totaled seven billion US dollars. And that really had a huge impact on market performance. But year to date this year, which is a chart towards the end, we have actually experienced more than two billion US dollars of net inflow into Hong Kong China mutual funds. For value partners, we're quite lucky. Last year, our fund actually experienced 800 million US dollars of net inflow. And year to date, we also experienced net inflows. What that suggests is that the majority of the fund inflow for us last year actually came from mostly Asian investors, particularly in Southeast Asia as well as um, Greater China region. So people who are based in Asia still feel that the growth opportunity, at least relatively speaking, is still in China. A lot of investors are concerned about the potential slowdown in GDP growth for China over the next couple of years. But really, the government has really managed people's expectation for a very long time already. About 12 months ago, when they talk about the 12th five-year plan, the plan targeted average GDP growth of 7% over the next five years, which is already much lower compared to the 8% in the previous 11th five-year plan. So there's no surprise that when the Premier of China announced in his, in his work report that the GDP growth target is 7.5% for this year, the market is actually has, has already priced that in. It's, it's well, uh, it, it is already well expected. But I do believe that some financial press has really overplayed this particular agenda. Even that, if you look historically, the Chinese GDP growth has always come fairly much above the targeted growth rate. In 2010, the target was 8%, the actual was 10.3. Last year, the target again was 8%, actual was 9.2. So, in a way, the Chinese government do set easy targets for themselves. Therefore, we believe that the GDP growth for this year will be around 8 to 8.5%, which is lower than last year, but still higher than 7.5% target. Inflation is coming down now to 4%, which is fairly much manageable. And we do, we do believe that long-term inflation between 3 to 4% is quite reasonable for China. Um, for, 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 for China as a whole and comparable to its growth rate. And importantly, money supply growth is also rebounding from last year's low. We are expecting M2 growth of 14%, a new loan amount of 8 trillion RMB, much higher than the 7.5 trillion for 2011. How much does export play a part in Chinese economic growth? Not that much for the past three years. Prior to 2008, China was the factory to the world. It was heavily reliant on export as a driver to GDP growth. But since the previous global financial crisis, China is now restructuring its, uh, restructuring its economic growth to more focus on domestic demand. So right now, 95% of China's GDP contribution actually come from domestic investment as well as domestic consumption. Only 5% is driven by net exports. 
And even that, there's a lot of processing trades. So we think that the impact of export slowdown, demand slowdown from the US or Europe, if it happens, um, on China is actually quite manageable compared to four years ago. This is one of the more important charts. Inflation is trending there. That's the blue line. PPI, which is a measure of input cost, has also come down to 0%. What that suggests is the asset price inflation risk that China has experienced over the past two years is coming to an end. This leaves the government much more room to maneuver in terms of policy support and even stimulus if required. And like I said earlier, the central bank, PBOC, has already cut bank reserve requirement ratio twice since the fourth quarter of last year. And we will expect further triple R cuts going forward. But things might get slightly worse before it gets better. There is a momentum in the economy to tend to trend down a bit further and does take a little bit more time for, for stimulus policy to take hold. We actually expect that GDP growth in China will bottom out sometime in the first half of this, this year before it starts to rebound in the second half of the year. So corporate earnings growth will effectively experience similar type of trend. Now let's look at the drivers part by part. We are confident on Chinese consumption. You can see from the chart on the right that retail growth in both nominal as well as real terms has been very stable at mid to high teams over the past years. This is partly driven by rising income levels, particularly minimum wages for Chinese workers. They have been increasing at a rate of roughly 20% per annum for the past two to three years, and we expect 10 to 15% growth for income over the next couple of years as well. This is a very important part of the Chinese consumption story. Investment, we don't believe that there will be a huge decline in overall investment. If we break down into various sectors, for some sectors, we will experience investment decline, particularly in the private housing sector, as well as the high-speed railway sector, given the difficulties experienced in those particular areas. But for other sectors, such as social economic housing, the government will put more money into it. Last year, they completed 5 million units of social economic housing. The target for this year is 7 million units. And when they said they want to get something done, it will get done. For water engineering, China is actually a country that's lack of water resources. They need to shift, basically trying to bring water conservation as well as bring water from the west to the east or from the south to the north. For the previous 10 years, only one trillion renminbi was spent on water engineering work, such as dams, irrigation, etc. Over the next 10 years, they will increase that by fourfold to four trillion RMB. So net net, the overall impact on investment, we believe, is actually quite negligible. Now, this chart is probably one of the more important charts you will see today, the valuation of the Chinese equity right now. Last year, Chinese equity filled around to about eight times earnings. At the end of last year, it's 8.8 .8 times. Right now, it is 9.5 times 2012 earnings. Historically, there has only been five instances where Chinese equity valuation fallen between nine times. The first time was in the 1997-98 Asian financial crisis. The second time was in during the 2000-2001 tech bubble. The third time was during 2003, the SARS epidemic in Asia. The fourth time was the 2008 global financial crisis. And the fifth and most recent time was October last year. What do all these have in common? People start to panic about financial market. People are in crisis mode. But each and every single time, valuation rebounds strongly back up once after they've fallen between nine times. 
So when the dip between below nine times, it's actually a screaming buy. It's actually a good opportunity to accumulate stocks when everyone else start to panic. So you can also see from the chart, we believe that earnings growth for last year, based on our own analysis of listed companies, averaged to be about 20%. Our earnings growth for this year will decline to 10 to 15%, again, in line with slowdown in GDP growth. But the devaluation of Chinese equities throughout the past 12, 18 months has been much higher. It came from 13.6% down to 9, uh, sorry, 13.6 times down to 9 times. It's almost a 30, 40% correction in valuation multiples. So people do overreact, and the amount of de-rating is much bigger than the earnings downgrade that corporate earnings actually experience. Going forward, how much upside we believe there will be? Even assuming there is no re-rating in earnings multiples, the market stays at 10 times P valuation, we believe that the 10 to 15% earnings growth itself will drive share price up by the same amount. Because eventually, analysts will roll over the forecast into 2013 forecast. So how do we make money for our investors in our portfolio this year? This is probably one of the most important strategy. we we'll focus on earnings growth as well as dividend yield. On earnings growth, like I said, we'll focus on companies with 10 to 15% earnings growth. But the key is solid earnings growth with high conviction. We don't want to invest into companies that might experience 40, 50% earnings growth this year, but you know, there's a lot of high degree of risk. We want to in invest in companies that can deliver solid earnings growth results. At the same time, we want to focus on companies that can pay out good dividends. Towards the end of last year, you can see from the chart on the right, again, average Asian listed company dividend yield has already surpassed the average Asian government bond yield. And that really sets a lot of opportunity in the equity market. They are really oversold. For us, dividend yield plays a very important part of return in volatile markets. It can be as much as one third of your return. So we'll be focusing on companies that have very strong balance sheet, cash flow, and let me tell you, most Chinese companies are much less leveraged compared to European or US companies, and they do have the ability to buy dividend. But besides ability, also the willingness to buy dividend. So we'll be looking at the dividend paying, payment track record, you know, how much dividend payout has it made historically. And there are a bunch of companies that can deliver that. So 10 to 15% earnings growth that drives share price upside, plus 4 to 5% dividend yield, will give you the targeted 15 to 20% portfolio return that we're hoping to achieve this year. Another strategy that we'll be focusing within our portfolio is the consumption story in China. More and more Chinese individuals, households, will move into the higher income category over the next five to 10 years. I mean, we already had a decade long of um, um, uh, wealth gathering and, uh, and wealth build up, but this will continue. And the Chinese like to upgrade the living standard once they have the money. They like to buy branded stuff. Just to give you some example, Prada is now a Hong Kong listed company. Greater China stock, BMW, has a joint venture in China that makes one series, sorry, that makes three series and five series cars, as well as the X1s. And they're selling like hotcakes. If you go to a BMW dealership, you have to wait three to six months for a car to be delivered to you. When I worked for Macquarie Bank 10 years ago, and I, 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 I went to China for business looking at Chinese deals, the majority of the cars that run on the streets were Japanese maker or Japanese branded cars, you know, the Nissans, the Toyotas. 
with very small engines, you know, 1.2 liters, 1.4 liters. But today, you see most of the taxis that run in Shanghai are Volkswagen. And for, you know, a middle income, so white collar worker, his preference car for his preference for a car will be the BMWs, the Audis, and for the super rich, it's even the Bentleys and the Maseratis. So this consumption upgrade story will continue over the next decade. And even for smaller goods, such as smartphones, iPhones, iPads, with the new iPad coming out in, 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 in various countries um, about a week ago, you cannot buy iPad in China anymore because they are all sold out. So one thing that people do is they buy them in Australia, bring them to Hong Kong, and sell it in the black market and make $2,000 profit. It's arbitrage one can do, but just shows the demand there is so strong. If you have a good product with a very strong brand name, people are willing to pay up for it. So all these luxury branded names are opening up shop across the country. Seven, eight years ago, it was only in the coastal region, you know, close to Hong Kong, the richest part of China. But gradually, they move inland as well. As a value health, we do place a lot of emphasis on the valuation of the sectors. The market as a whole is now trading about 20% above the growth valuation that we reached in 2008, with, with the exception of two sectors, the banking sector and the utility sector. I wouldn't worry too much about the utility sector because that's a sector highly subject to government policy influence. The utility sector, the power producers, has no pricing power. Whatever electricity they sell to the grid, the price is set by the government. So it's a sector that we want to avoid for now. But for the banking sector, it's a sector that we believe that will still have a lot of opportunities over the longer term. Short term wise, there are some overhangs, such as you know, the concern regarding non-performing loans, the concerns regarding you know, the, 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 the continuous need for the banks to come to the market for refinancing and rising capital. Those are the short term overhangs. But longer term wise, the banks are the best proxy for economic growth. And given that they're cheap valuation, we believe there's a lot of opportunities if one has a long enough investment horizon. So for the banking sector, it's purely a valuation call. And finally, one of the top strategy for this year is also being defensive. How do we be defensive? We want to hedge against things like rising inflation down the track. The geopolitical risks are out there. How do we achieve that? But have a high exposure in the energy sector as well as in precious metal. Because we believe that as the world central bank prints more money, effectively we're flooded with liquidity and paper currency. Those monies that are printed are essentially borrowings from you and me. And for them to repay, well, actually they cannot repay. So what they do is they will devalue the currency. There will be rounds of currency competitive devaluation. The money you hold in your bank account will worth less and less. To hedge against that, you need ownership in hard assets. Farmlands are good. Of course, we can't invest in farmland for equity fund, but you know, for Australian you know, people, I think farmland is actually a good investment over the longer term. But we invest into companies that have access or ownership in them. Ownership in coal, ownership in oil, ownership in natural gas, and ownership in precious metals such as gold and silver. <coughs> so right now, about 30% of our portfolio is allocated to the energy and precious metal sector. And they also offer a good hedge against geopolitical risk. So with better monetary condition, mo monetary condition in line fiscal policy, low valuation, we believe that equity markets, after two years of underperformance, particularly last year, will do better this year. Very quickly, just turn to some of the concerns that investors have. This is a widely quoted uh, city, or those in Inner Mongolia, China, by Western Press last year. They, 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 they basically brand it as a ghost town. Why is a ghost town? It's a mining city. 
that has been growing very fast over the past couple of years. There's only two types of assets that this city has, coal and rare earths. And you can see coal price has really boomed up since 2004, 2005. And the city's GDP has grown 13-fold over that period, while property prices have gone up 8-fold. But even after 8-fold increase in property price, it's still below 4,000 RMB per square meter, which is only one-third of that in Beijing and Shanghai. It's a very small city with a population 1.7 million only, compared to Beijing and Shanghai, over 20 million. But its GDP per capita ranked number one in China. So with the success of this city in such short period of time, it has attracted a lot of speculative money. As a result of that, there has been overbuilt of property in that particular city. But this is more an exception rather than the norm case in China. In China, the majority of the cities the property demand is still driven by first-time owner-occupiers. Um, I'll just skip that. This just shows the valuation of the Chinese developers. A second concern that people have regarding China is corporate governance. But let me tell you, corporate governance is not just an Asian or China issue. It's actually a global issue. The most famous corporate governance sort of fraudulent cases actually occur in the United States and Europe. Our sale says that when we invest in company, we focus on the three R's. The right business with the right, uh, run, run, run by the right people at the right price. You can't have an analyst who sits in the office away from Asia, looking at valuations, reads annual reports and quarterly reports, and decide whether this is a good buy or not. We need people who are actually on the ground, talking to management, Particularly to the people factor is very important. And that's the sort of qualitative research that a house like us will bring to investors. What we do here is nothing really sort of beyond sort of um, uh, you know, overly sophisticated or, 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 or rocket science. It's all very simple grassroots research stuff. But with our team of 41 investment professionals, Together with our affiliated joint ventures, we have over 60 investment people doing all this on the ground research. And we're confident that can we, we can avoid all those fraudulent or corporate governance traps in China. The other thing I'd like to mention is that when investing into a Chinese companies, trying to avoid those ones that are listed outside Hong Kong and China main, uh, uh, main Hong Kong China stock exchanges. It is those ones that will cause you the biggest headache. Sanofors, some of you might know the name, is a company that listed in the Canadian Stock Exchange. Turned out to be a Fujian company. Most of the internet companies that are listed in the US has zero profit. You know, they just continue to continuously to be loss making. Yet the American investors are pouring money into them, making the market capitalization very big. I just don't understand that. They are the sort of risk companies that you should avoid. How do people see the Australian equity market or financial market? Very simple. We see it as a commodity-driven market. The Aussie dollar has high, this is a Aussie dollar, has high correlation to the commodity price index, in turn, which is a lot driven by Chinese economic growth. If China's economic growth does well, commodity price will do well, Aussie dollar will do well, and vice versa. And if you look at the composition, the MSA in China is predominantly dominated by financial and energy sector, while in Australia, it's dominated by financials and materials. Now, we all know that Australian domestic consumption stocks are experiencing a lot of difficulty right now. When I was here three months ago for Christmas holiday, news reported about you know, how bad Billabong was and Kathmandu was. I think they're still talking about Kathmandu. Yesterday, David Jones reported a very poor result as well. So, Investing into Australian domestic consumption sector, I think there's a lot of risk there. I'm not too sure about the financials, but in the material sector, sure, BHP, Real Tino are good companies, but they're also worldly held, well, highly invested by, by the majority of, of investors out there. A lot of good news has been priced into them. If China goes bad, BHP and real share price will fall. They're, they're, they're not immune. But if you look at some of the Chinese companies, they are now trading at half the time 
or 0.5 times price to book for the Chinese steel sector, for example. I know there are a lot of issues regarding the steel sector, but again, on the, there are too many bad news has been priced into them. So if China does well, the steel sector will rally much harder and has much higher potential upside compared to BHP or Rio. So for that matter, it is a, the risk-reward trade-off really favors the Chinese companies over the Australian commodity stocks. So with that, I'll conclude my presentation and hand it back to Jonathan. Thank you.